from portrait. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, a portrait of Clark County needs of a community is a way for us to collect qualitative data from the community regarding the needs identified by people who are struggling financially in our community. And I wanna thank you all for participating. We really appreciate your feedback in our community needs assessment process. Before we get started, I want to give a special thanks to the CNA task force that has been helping provide support and feedback throughout this process. The CNA task force is made up of community action advisory board members and um, service providers and community advocates. And their work is not quite done yet, but we couldn't get to the point we're at without them. Um, I also want to thank my fellow Clark County Community Services staff who've been incredibly helpful throughout this process, especially to Rebecca Royce and Jackie St. Louis for gathering and analyzing the survey data. I also want to thank the volunteers who will be taking notes during our small group discussions today and our co-sponsors for the event, who include the Community Action Partnership, Council for the Homeless, the Scholar Fund, the Community Foundation for Southwest Washington, the Ch Children's Home Society of Washington, the Washington State Office of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing, NIA Family Center, and Peace Northwest. So I'm sure most of you are very familiar with Zoom at this point, but I wanna provide a few pointers and requests to help this virtual forum run smoothly. So all participants have been muted to reduce background noise, and we ask that you remain muted if you're not speaking, but we want this to be an interactive experience. So please raise your hand or type a question in the chat if you have any questions during the presentation. And um, this forum is also being recorded to aid in information gathering and personally identifying information won't be made public unless you speak your name out loud when asking a question. There will also be several polls and surveys that will pop up on your screen throughout the forum, and we hope that you'll participate and all responses will be anonymous. So for the agenda today, we're going to start with a poll that will help us all get to know each other a bit better, get a sense of who's here today, and then I'll go over some background information about why we're all doing this and how the information we've collected here will be used. Um, then we will have another poll to help dispel some of the myths about poverty and help us contextualize um, the data that I'll be uh, presenting today. Then I'll talk through the data that we've collected so far. We'll take a quick stretch break and then reconvene for small group discussions and finish up with a final poll to assess your takeaways from the event. So first of all, we wanna learn a little bit more about all of the participants who are here today. The poll oh, looks like it just popped up on the screen. So please let us know if you don't see it. There are eight questions total and I'll give you all a couple minutes to answer the questions. And once everyone's finished, I'll go over the answers. And again, your responses are completely anonymous. All right, are folks still answering the poll or do people need more time?
looks like the responses have slowed down. Um, feel free to raise your hand if you need more time. Otherwise, I think we can go ahead and end the poll. All right, so hopefully the results have popped up on your screen. Um, so if you look at the first question, how did you hear about this event? It looks like most folks heard about it through employer recommendation or press release, online media, or a few people answered other. Um, for the affiliation that best describes you, looks like most of the people here today are service providers. We also have some advocates and volunteers and some community residents. Um, for the race question, it looks like we have a pretty good mix of people from different races. Most of the people in the room are white, but it looks like we also have some folks who identify as Asian, Black and African American, Native American or Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander or multiracial. For age, it looks like most of the people today are between 24 to 44, but we also have some folks between 45 to 54 and between 55 to 69. Um, it looks like most people here reside in Vancouver or outside of Clark County. We've also got a few from Battleground and Washougal. Um, it looks like most people have lived or worked in Clark County for over 10 years, but we have some people who've been here less time. Um, for the question, have you or anyone in your family ever needed public services? It looks like 56% of the people said yes and 44% said no. And for the question, do you pay more than 30% of your income for housing? It looks like 44% said yes and 52% said no. So for those who answered yes to question seven or eight, I just want to let you all know that you are not alone. According to the U.S. Census Bureau 2022 estimates, 44,315 or 8.9% of Clark County residents earn income below the federal poverty level, which is currently set at 27,750 for a family of four. And there are many social service programs which offer assistance to persons or households up to 200% of the federal poverty level, which would include about 108,803 people in Clark County. Additionally, according to HUD's comprehensive housing affordable strategy data, um, 43.8% of all Clark County renters or and 23 point or 21.3% of all Clark County owners pay more than 30% of their income toward their housing costs. So now that we know a little bit more about who's here today, let's talk about why we're doing this whole process. So first of all, what is community action? On January 8th, 1964, which was exactly 60 years ago, as of a couple weeks ago, President Lyndon Johnson enacted the War on Poverty. He believed that poverty had to be addressed at the local level and created the Community Action Network of nationally and locally focused anti-poverty organizations. So in our area, Clark County Community Services is the designated community action agency. And as the community action agency, we receive community services block grant funds to help alleviate the causes and conditions of poverty in our area. And to work on ending poverty, we complete a community needs assessment every three years or CNA, which is the abbreviation. And we use this CNA to first collect and analyze data about the needs of our community that have low incomes, to inform future uh, funding decisions, and also to inform policy and program decisions. And the CNA is a requirement of the Community Services Block Grant Act, Section 676B11. And there are four required components of the CNA. There's quantitative data, qualitative data, demographic information, and causes and conditions of poverty. First, to collect quantitative data, we assess American Community Survey data, which comes from the U.S. Census, and we also review other local um, needs assessments and publish documents. And then, for the largest part of uh, the largest part of our community needs assessment, we do a Clark County Community Survey of Needs, which I'll discuss more momentarily. 
And the results of this survey are the bulk of our community needs assessment and is the data that I'll go over today. And for qualitative data, this event and the other community forum events that we're holding throughout the county are our primary source of qualitative data collection. Today, you all will provide your feedback on the survey results through um, small group discussions. And then the data that we collect based on your feedback will be incorporated into our final community needs assessment report, which informs spending decisions countywide for the next three years. So thank you all so much for being here and for providing your feedback and being such an important part of our CNA process. And then again, we'll also review other local needs assessments and publish documents to fill out the qualitative data. And to collect demographic information, we use the American Community Survey or census data to assess the overall demographic distribution in Clark County. And then we also include a number of demographic questions in the survey to assess the demographic distribution of those who responded to the survey. Um, and I'll go over a bit of that demographic information that we collected. And then based on all of the information we collect, we work to determine the causes and conditions of poverty in Clark County. So as I just mentioned, one of the biggest components of the CNA is the survey of needs. Using this survey, we get to hear straight from people who are struggling financially about their needs in several categories. And I'll talk more about what those needs specifically were momentarily. And the surveys were anonymous. Not every question was answered by every respondent, which you'll notice when we go through the survey data. And each chart will indicate the number of people who answered that specific question. The survey was distributed from February 2nd through April 14th, 2023. It was available in hard copy in English, Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, and Chu Keys, and online in English, Spanish, Russian, and Vietnamese. The surveys were distributed through news releases, social media, and over 100 partner organizations that serve low-income community members. Um, we aim to prioritize feedback from low-income community members, which you'll see in the income chart when I review the demographic data. And the surveys received 893 total responses. We unfortunately didn't receive as high of a response rate as we have in the past. Um, in 2019, for example, we received 1,655 responses, and we suspect that this decrease was due to the pandemic. Um, so we're hoping to increase the response rate for future years and then also use the information that we collect during these forums to fill out the data and make sure that the survey um, data accurately reflects the needs of our Clark County community. And the last CNA was completed in 2020. If you'd like to view the results from this assessment, this version is available on our website, which can be accessed via this link or QR code, which I'll paste in the chat um, once we go on break. And so before we get into the survey data, we wanna make sure that we're all on the same page about um, some of the poverty statistics in Clark County. There are a lot of myths about people who struggle financially, and we want to help dispel some of those myths. So again, the poll will pop up on your screen. Please answer all six questions and click submit, and then I'll go over the answers. And again, all the answers are anonymous.
All right, I'll give you all another 30 seconds to respond and feel free to raise your hand if you need more time. All right, I'm not seeing any more responses come in. So Rebecca, I think we can go ahead and end the poll. Great, so the results should have popped up on your screen. Again, let me know if you don't see them. So for the first question, which was how much do you need to make per hour to afford a one bedroom apartment in Clark County? It looks like the highest response was 2583 per hour. And the answer to this question is actually 3096 per hour for a one bedroom apartment. This is according to the Out of Reach Washington report, which is created by the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Someone working for minimum wage could afford an apartment at $818 a month if they were paying 30% of their income, or they would need to work 79 hours per week. For the second question, the federal poverty threshold definition that is used to determine the federal poverty level was designated as the official definition of poverty in what year? It looks like it was a tie between 1969 and 1975. The answer is 1969. The federal poverty threshold was developed by Molly Orshansky, a staff economist at the Social Security Administration in 1963, and then designated as the federal government's official statistical definition of poverty in August of 1969. The formula has not been updated since its inception and doesn't take into consideration childcare costs that are common in today's society. Question three was racial wealth inequity continues to impact prosperity in the US. It looks like the vast majority of folks said true, and that is correct. Um, according to the US Census Bureau 2022 estimates, which you can see in this chart, 8% um, of people who identify as white live below the federal poverty level in Clark County, while people who identify as Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, Black or African American, Native American or Alaska Native, Asian, other or two or more races experience poverty as at much higher rates, as you can see in this chart. Question four was, if every person in the U.S. that is living in poverty lived in the same state, it would be the most populous state in the nation. Again, looks like most people said true, and that is correct. According to the U.S. Census Bureau data 2023 estimates, 42.31 million people are estimated to live under the federal poverty level in the U.S. This is higher than the population of California, which is the country's most populated state, at 38.96 million. Question five was nearly one of every 10 children in Clark County live in poverty. Looks like most people said true. Again, that's correct. Uh, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 10.9% of children under the age of 18 in Clark County, which is about 12,496 children, live below the federal poverty level. And the last question, for the most part, people living in poverty do not work. It looks like everyone said false, and that is correct. Um, over 78% of people who are eligible to work, which is age 16 and over, are living below the federal poverty level, who are living below the, the federal poverty level are employed. Um, so thank you all so much for participating in the poll. I hope this helps everyone have um, a better understanding about some of the statistics and impacts of poverty in our area. And now I'd like to introduce Michael Torres, manager of the Community Action Housing and Development Unit in Clark County Community Services. He's going to lead us through some more specific information about how racism intersects with poverty in Clark County um, to provide a bit more context before we break out into the survey data. Thank you, Abby. And uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Michael Torres. I'm program manager at Clark County Community Services. And before we break out into the groups, as Abby indicated, I just we just wanted to touch on the impacts of race and racism 
on uh, po like poverty level and the conditions of living in po poverty here in Clark County. I'm not going to uh, read uh, this slide or the next slide, but I, I do want to point out the data we collect locally shows us or reconfirms what we know from research at the national level, which is that race equity relates, uh, relates to poverty because it is a leading predictor of inequity in every system across the country without exception. So when we look at disparities in outcomes, race is the, you know, if I'm talking about health, I'm talking about education, criminal justice, employment, asset building, you name it. Race is going to be the leading predictor of disproportionality. That is even true when we talk about other dimensions of identity, things like income, uh, gender, uh, sexuality, education, um, uh, ability, age, citizenship, uh, geography. So, you know, you name it, uh, race-based inequities remain the dominant factor. So even when we start talking about uh, addressing intersectionality, like we have to start by looking at race. And the, what you see in the chart in front of you, we're talking about the racial disparities in terms of both likelihood of experiencing poverty and likelihood of experiencing homelessness uh, here in Clark County by looking at our uh, 2021 American Community Service Survey five-year estimates and uh, breaking it down uh, by race. And when it comes to homelessness um, averages, we're looking at our local uh, homeless management information system data. This is publicly available uh, on uh, online. If you go to councilforhomeless.org and you look at what about homelessness, you can find these, uh, find these charts. But again, here in Clark County, we continue to see what we know to be true nationally, which is race is a real factor in predicting poverty, predicting homelessness, and predicting inequities in any other system. Next slide, please. So these are just examples of how race, uh, uh, race disproportionality is manifested here in Clark County. And you know, so we see it in homelessness, uh, we see it in earning of income, uh, we see it in educational impacts, and, uh, and we actually also see it in impacts of things like we just went through, like the pandemic and COVID. So I'm just pausing a moment so you can read through a slide. Next slide, please. So looking at, uh, looking at by race, disproportionality again, and disproportionality meaning that uh, a segment of our population that is race-based is having different experiences and different incomes in terms of, of poverty, homelessness, system inequities uh, in our community. So black people, which represent less than 3% of Clark County population, they make up 11% of jail admissions, 25% of uh, eviction resolution uh, pilot par uh, program participants, and 30% of children under 18 who experienced homelessness in 2021. Those are just direct local examples of uh, disproportionality, which can be predicted by race, you know, like as a as a leading indicator uh, here. So, uh, so those are just uh, um, you know just an issue that I want you, I want you to have in mind as we get into the next group discussions. And thank you, Abby. Thank you, Michael. So now that we have some more background information about the CNA, as well as broad impacts of poverty and the intersection between poverty and racism in Clark County, let's view the data that we collected during the 2023 survey of needs. There are 10 categories from this survey, which I'll cover. And because there's a lot of information, I'll be going through the data pretty quickly. Um, but I'll provide a link at the end if you wanna look at the data more slowly and provide your feedback on specific slides. 
And also all of the data on the slides is available in English, but if you would like a copy of the data in uh, Spanish, Russian, or two keys, please feel free to reach out and I'll get that information to you. So the first category asked survey respondents to identify the needs and barriers that they or someone in their family currently experience regarding education services. There were 438 respondents who identified an educational need. And of these, the top need identified was financial assistance to go to college, which was selected by nearly half of those who had an educational need or 45%. This was followed by applying for financial aid and scholarships and summer youth recreational activities. There were 409 respondents who indicated that they or someone in their family had an education barrier. Over half or 61% of respondents identified not knowing where to go as a current barrier to accessing education services. And this was followed by getting to services and qualifying for services. And to supplement this data, we have a chart here which shows the graduation rates in Clark County over the last five years. You can see that these have remained mostly consistent on average, but there has been a bit of variation within each district. And I also want to highlight this statistic from uh, the Georgetown University on Education in the Workforce, which provides some additional context about why the top two education needs involved financial aid for higher education. It states, since 1980, the average cost of college has increased by 169%, while the pay for young workers has only increased by 19%. The next category asked survey respondents about employment needs and barriers that they or someone in their family currently experience. There were 390 respondents with employment needs. Just under half identified finding a job as a current need or concern. And this was followed by job training and skills improvement and getting a better job, which could include more hours, larger responsibility, uh, more pay or more benefits. There were 348 respondents who identified employment barriers. Again, the top uh, barrier identified was not knowing where to go, which was again followed by getting to services and qualifying for services. For some additional context, uh, the National Low Income Housing Coalition shows that in Clark County, the highest median wage workers are software developers who make 76.22 per hour while the lowest median wage workers earn $17.33 per hour at fast food establishments, which is a difference of $59 per hour. And this chart here shows the unemployment rates in Clark County, Washington State, and the U.S. from the beginning of 2020 through the end of 2023. I don't think any of us are surprised to see this huge spike in unemployment around April 2020, which has gradually decreased and now sits around pre-pandemic levels. Um, and you can see in this chart that Clark County has remained at about the same unemployment rate as the state and the nation um, with, you know, a few months that have been higher or lower. Next, we asked survey respondents about their housing needs and barriers. There were 545 respondents who identified housing needs and almost two thirds of respondents said that affordable housing was a top need or concern. And this was followed by rent assistance, and the third was tied at moving cost assistance and utility payment assistance. There were 488 respondents, 81 respondents who said they had housing barriers. Again, the top barrier was not knowing where to go, followed by qualifying for services and getting to services. Um, for some more context about the high need for affordable housing and rent assistance in Clark County, the National Low Income Housing Coalition shows that Washington State has the fifth highest housing wage. To afford an average two bedroom apartment, a person needs to make $36.33 per hour full time or work 92 hours per week at minimum wage. This chart also shows the number of people identified as homeless on a single day in January of each year since 2013. This just provides a snapshot of homelessness in Clark County, but you can see that the number of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness has nearly doubled over the last 10 years. For the next category, survey respondents were asked about the needs and barriers that they or their family members experience regarding income and asset building services. 
there were 447 respondents um, who identified needs in this category. And among those needing help, um, the top needs included credit repair, financial planning and budgeting classes, and financial assistance to buy a home. There were 402 respondents with income and asset building barriers. Once again, the majority of respondents said they didn't know where to go. Um, and this was followed by getting to services and qualifying for services. Again, to provide some supplemental information about income and asset building needs in Clark County, an estimated 2.1% of Washington state households were unbanked in 2021, meaning that no one in their household had a checking or savings account at a bank or credit union. And this is actually 2.4% lower than the national average, which sits at 4.5% of US households. And then this chart shows the median home selling price in Washington state in blue and in Clark County in green over the last 10 years. The orange line also shows the price that would be affordable for a family of four making area median income. And you can see that the gap between the affordable price and the actual price has continued to widen over the last 10 years, which I don't think surprises any of us. Uh, survey respondents were then asked about the needs and barriers that they have regarding physical health needs. Um, there were 409 respondents with physical health needs and dental services topped the list of um, physical health concerns, both paying for dental services and seeing a dentist. And then food assistance and access to fresh and healthy foods were also mentioned by nearly half of those facing physical health needs. There were 445 respondents with physical health barriers. Again, the, the top barrier was not knowing where to go, followed by getting to services and qualifying for services. And importantly, income is strongly associated with health outcomes, including risk for disease and premature death. If income levels were steps on a ladder, the lower steps would have higher rates of uh, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and other chronic conditions compared with their higher income counterparts. And this chart here shows that the type of health insurance people have based on their, house, their household income in Clark County you can see that the number of people with private coverage dramatically increased for households with an income over $100,000 or more per year. Next, respondents were asked about their behavioral health needs and barriers. There were 340 respondents who identified behavioral health needs. Um, a majority of respondents expressed interest in mental health services. Um, and concerns about access to counseling, marriage, family, or life, and paying for services were also prevalent. Um, almost two-thirds of respondents said they didn't know where to go to access behavioral health services, and other top barriers were getting to services and qualifying for services. We might be sensing a theme here. Um, and when considering mental health and substance use services and needs, uh, I just want to point out that harm reduction, which is a strategy that includes safer drug use, managed use, and meeting people who use drugs where they're at, has been proven to save lives and reduce health care spending. And this infographic, which was taken from the National Alliance on Mental Illness, shows a number of statistics which demonstrate the disproportionality by which people with mental illness are involved in the criminal justice system. Uh, to briefly name a few about two out of five people who are incarcerated have a history of a mental health condition, um, and nearly one out of four people who are shot and killed by the police have a mental illness. So I encourage you to look at these statistics more closely after the presentation if you would like, um, and all of them highlight the first sentence in the infographic which states, people with mental illness deserve help, not handcuffs. And lastly, survey respondents were asked to identify the needs or barriers that they or someone in their family currently experience regarding support services. There were 445 respondents with support service needs. Almost two thirds or 64% said that paying for vehicle costs was a current need or concern. And this was followed by paying for transportation and information and referral services. 
There were 401 respondents with support service barriers. Again, the majority identified not knowing where to go as a current barrier, followed by getting to services and quality qualifying for services. So since um, paying for vehicles and transportation was identified as the top two needs in this category, this chart here compares the cost per month of different transportation methods in Clark County. You can see that a local bus pass, regional bus pass, and express to Portland bus pass are not cheap, but all fall under $200 per month, whereas owning a vehicle costs on average over $1,000 per month. This is a huge leap and a financial barrier which prevents many people from accessing uh, services, employment, child care, et cetera. And as you've seen throughout all the categories, not knowing where to go was identified as the primary barrier across all categories. So I just want to remind everyone about 211 Info, which is a local referral service for Oregon and Southwest Washington, which provides free confidential information about health, community, and social services near you. The service can be reached by dialing 211 or texting your zip code to 898211 or TXT211. Um, so those were the eight main categories that we had. And then survey respondents were also presented with a list of various needs across all of the categories. And they were asked to assess their needs for their family in the past year as a high, a medium, low, or not a need. And um, most respondents, or 87%, identified food assistance as a need. And other areas with especially widespread need included dental services, housing assistance, and asset building. Respondents were also asked whether the COVID-19 pandemic increased their needs and which areas of need were specifically impacted. There were 461 respondents, or 58%, which stated that the COVID-19 pandemic did increase their needs. And among those who saw increased needs, 68% identified food assistance as an area of increased need. And this was followed by housing assistance and mental health supports. And then, like I said earlier, we also included a number of demographic questions on the survey to better understand who this data was coming from. And this isn't all the demographic data we've collected, but I just wanted to share a few statistics. So we asked people about their age. Most people who took the survey were between 25 to 44. Um, when asked about gender identity, most of the people who took this survey identified as female, um, while 24% identified as male and 2% as genderqueer or non-binary. When asked about race, you can see this chart here shows the racial distribution of those who took the survey, as well as um, residents of Clark County and residents of Clark County who live below the federal poverty level. So you can see that the um, ratio of survey respondents by race pretty closely matched um, those in Clark County who live below the federal poverty level, which is what we were aiming for. When asked about their current housing situation, most survey respondents were renters. There were also some owners, 12% who identified as houseless or homeless, and 6% who are staying with family and friends. When asked if um, respondents' families earned more or less than the federal poverty level, um, most of the respondents earned less than the federal poverty level. You can see this chart, which shows um, the ratio of folks who took the survey who earned more or less than 125% and more or less than 200% of the federal poverty level. And then this map here shows um, where in Clark County survey respondents were residing. Uh, looks like the majority lived in the Vancouver area, but we had a pretty good mix from throughout the county. All right, so that is the data that we've collected so far. Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then reconvene for group discussions. And if you want to view the data more closely and provide specific feedback on each category, please scan the QR code or click the link that I'll paste in the chat momentarily. So let's plan to reconvene at 10.53. Hi everyone, welcome back. 
Um, so before we break out into our discussion groups, um, I'm just going to go over some group agreements and then randomly assign you into breakout rooms to discuss your thoughts on the data and the four questions that we've prepared. Um, we hope this is a comfortable space for you to speak in. However, if you don't feel comfortable speaking aloud, you can provide your feedback in the satisfaction survey that will be available um, at the end of the event. Each group will have a designated note taker to capture the ideas expressed, but names and any identifying information will not be included. So before we go into our groups, I just wanna go over some group norms. These are the group agreements that we use at Clark County Community Services, and I just wanna share them with you all. So the first agreement is to stay engaged. This means leaning into the relationship of the group, engaging in the conversation, whether that is speaking or listening and practicing group collectivism rather than individualism. We are all here with the same goal. The second is listen to understand. This means actively listening to your group members with the intention of understanding the stories and the meaning behind their words. Next, we ask you to speak your truth responsibly. This involves engaging in the conversation in a productive way that remains on topic as well as adds to the conversation. It also involves acknowledging the potential impact and harm of your behavior and your words and working not to cause harm during discussions. This also requires considering how your words or silence will impact those in your group. Uh, then we will expect and accept non-closure. We're not going to solve poverty in Clark County during our discussions today, but we hope that these conversations will help advance the anti-poverty work in the county and contribute to long-term solutions. Next, uh, we ask that you are open to new ideas and willing to do things differently, and that you're open to experiencing discomfort. There may be difficult conversations and disagreements in your group, and we ask that you prepare for this potential discomfort. Next, we will be mindful of power dynamics among group members and how this impacts the group conversations as well as your role within your group. Uh, for example, some power dynamics may include employer and employee or government official and community member. There are also power dynamics that exist in relationships between gender, people of different ages, or people with different education levels, to name a few. And finally, we will maintain confidentiality. There will be note takers in each group to capture ideas, um, but again, names and personal information will not be recorded. So we ask that you do the same, have specific stories told, stay here, but the knowledge that they impart will leave. And with that, we now have 40 minutes for discussion. There are four discussion questions, which will be up on the screen, and I'll also put them in the chat. Um, the discussion flow can be determined by each group, but I'll remind you to move towards the next question every and every tense. And I'll put the first question up on the screen and in the chat. And I'll also be popping around to different breakout groups to listen in and see if I can provide any additional support. And feel free to let me know if you have any questions or issues with the breakout rooms. So the first question for today is, what do you think about when you see the information provided today? And is there anything significant or interesting? And with that, I will go ahead and open up the breakout rooms. All right, it looks like everyone is back in the main room. Thank you all for participating in our conversations. I heard a lot of really great conversations happening and I'm excited to hear about the takeaways. Um, so before we close out, I have one last poll to assess your um, takeaways from this event. There will be three questions um, which ask about services in our community. And as with previous polls, your answers will be anonymous.
All right. It looks like most people have had a chance to answer. Do people want a bit more time? All right. In that case, I think we can go ahead and share the results. All right. So the first question was, how do you think social services are best provided? It looks like almost everyone said a combination of the above. Um, and for context, the above was faith-based organizations, private donations to local charities, government assistance, and family and friends. And a few people said government assistance or family and friends. The second question was, our community is doing a great job helping those in need of assistance. Looks like most people said neutral. The second most common answer was a disagree and third was agree. And the third question, where would you direct more funding if you could? Looks like most people said housing assistance. We also had some folks say education services, employment services, mental health services, food assistance, and youth services. All right, well, thank you all so much for participating. Um, we really appreciate your feedback and your help with this process. Um, for the next steps, we're going to work with our consultant, Jackie St. Louis, to analyze the feedback that we received during these forums. And then we'll integrate this feedback into the final community needs assessment report. Once the report's complete, we'll review it with the CNA task force that I discussed earlier and then present it to the Community Action Advisory Board for approval. Um, the Community Action Advisory Board, for those who don't know, is a group of elected officials, low-income representatives, and community representatives who advise the county um, and advocate on behalf of people who are low-income. And once this report is adopted by this board, which we call the CAB, it will be published and distributed to the community. So please email me um, or include your email on the satisfaction survey if you'd like to receive a copy of the final report. Um, and if you're interested in being more involved in Clark County Community Services anti-poverty work, we currently have three open positions on the Community Action Advisory Board. So if you're interested, please feel free to scan the QR code and I'll also paste a link in the chat in just a second. And also feel free to reach out to me if you'd like more information. Leave that up for a second. And with that, that concludes our forum. Thank you all so much for being here and for sharing your perspective. Um, if you have time, please complete the satisfaction survey to tell us how we did, um, to provide additional info, and to sign up to receive the completed community needs assessment. You can scan the QR code in the language that you prefer, um, or I'll also paste the link in the chat. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me, and I'll also stay on for a few more minutes if anyone has any questions. Thank you, everyone.